You're good. Good afternoon. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the Business Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee. Chug Tai, Chavez, and Rainville. I, I know Councilmember Ellison will be here in a moment. Uh, there will be five of us on the committee today. Uh, we are going to start with the consent agenda, which is items eight, which are the liquor license renewals. Uh, approvals and nine are the liquor license renewals. Item number 10 are the gambling license approvals and 11 is a bond issuance which is granting Hennepin County the authority to issue bonds for the labor retreat housing partners project on 14th Street Southeast. Item 12 is regulation of tobacco ordinance which is a referral to committee as is item 13 on taxi cabs. Item 14 is setting a public hearing for a revenue bond issuance at Wadag Commons. Item 15 is setting a public hearing for the TIF plan for Agra affordable housing. Uh, so I am going to move all of the consent items unless there's any items anyone would like to pull. Seeing none, let the record reflect that we've been joined by Council Member Ellison. All in favor of the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Those items are approved. Thank you all for your patience. We'll move on to our public hearing agenda, starting with item number one, which is Norway House. Ms. Dominguez, welcome. Hello. Thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members. I am License Inspector Beth Dominguez with Licenses and Consumer Services. I'm presenting an application from Norway House located at 913 Franklin Avenue, Ward 6. The current license is an on-sale wine with strong beer and general entertainment. The applicant is requesting a permanent expansion of premises. The expansion of premises includes a new addition to their cultural center that will include indoor seating for 244 and outdoor seating for 12 on a private patio. Norway House intends to expand their food and wine license to these areas. Uh, the Norway House has been operating at this location since 2018. Hours of operation are Tuesday 12 to 4, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., Thursday 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., and occasional events 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Monday through Sunday. On August 31st, public hearing notices were sent to residents and property owners within 600 feet of the premises. Notices were also sent to Ventura Village Neighborhood Association, the Franklin Area Business Association, and Council Member Osman. We have received zero comments from the committee, community, and no complaints or police calls have been received. The license Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of a permanent expansion of premises for Norway House. And this concludes my presentation. I will stand for any comments. Thank you so much, Ms. Dominguez. We'll see if there are any questions for you. Are there any from members of the committee? Seeing none, we will thank you for your report and open the public hearing on item number one, which is a permanent expansion of premise at Norway House. Is there anyone here to speak to this issue? I understand one person has signed up. Ms. Rogers, you are welcome to speak now. Please state your name and address for the record. Hi, yes, my name is Megan Rogers and I'm uh, with Larkin Hoffman and we represent Norway House. Uh, I have uh, Joseph here who is our Management and Operations Director who is happy to answer any questions that you may have as well. Um, but we thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. I don't believe there are any questions. Uh, we'll see if there's anyone else here to speak to this issue. Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Ellison. Madam Chair, thank you. I'm happy to move approval of this item. Uh, approval has been moved of item number one. Further comments and questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item is approved. Thank you for being here today. On item number two, Somali Community Resettlement Services at 2115 Stevens Avenue South. This is a rental hall and extended hours license. Ms. Lingo, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair, uh, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Amy Lingo, Manager for Licenses and Consumer Services, and I am presenting an application from Somali Community Resettlement Services by Somali Community Resettlement Services of Olmstead County. This is a nonprofit organization. This business is located at 2115 Stevens Avenue in Ward 10, rental license and extended hours of operation. The SCRS will be taking over the Gale Mansion Event Center. 
the applicant's primary purpose, which includes the delivery of the following services, community training and education, community clinics, like vaccinations, health and wellness, recreational and cultural events, small private wedding venue, religious and political events, holiday celebrations, fundraisers, dignitaries, etc., social service facilities and programming, after school hour programs and tutoring. The proposed hours of operation are Sunday to Thursday, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., Friday to Saturday, 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. On August 31st, 107 notices were sent to property owners within 300 feet of the premises. Notices were sent also to the Whittier Alliance neighborhood and to Council Member Choktai. We have received one response from the community which supports the new license. One recommendation they would like to make as part of the application process is to consider parking for the SCRS events. SCRS does intend to contract valet parking for any events that exceed 100 people. There are no operating conditions or issues. The Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of the rental hall and extended hours licenses. This concludes my presentation and I stand for any questions. Are there any questions for Ms. Lingo on her report? Seeing none, thank you for being here today. We'll open the public hearing on item number two and I see there are three people to sign up and you are welcome to come up one at a time and state your name and address for the record. Good afternoon, members of the City Council, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anissa Hajimomin, and I'm the Organizational Development Director for Somali Community and Resettlement Services, and I'll be here for any questions that you might have for us. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here today. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Rainville. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move approval of item number two, the Somali Community Resettlement Services. Councilmember Rainville has moved item number two. Are there further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. Thank you for being here, ladies. We'll move on to item number three. Um, and I believe Mr. Muhammad has. Thank you for being here today. This is the Briar at 12. 31 Washington for an on-sale liquor with general entertainment. Welcome. Thank you. Chairman Goodman and committee members. I am licensed inspector Akbar Mohammed, licenses and consumer services. I'm presenting the application from the Briar owned by Portland Lake House LLC. The business address is 1231 Washington Street Northeast, located in Ward 1. Current license is a food restaurant license. The applicant is requesting on-sale liquor with Sunday sales, general entertainment. The proposed hours for the interior and exterior are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., Saturday, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Sunday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. They have indoor seating for 40 patrons and outdoor for 36 patrons on a private patio. On September 11, public hearing notices were sent to the residents and property owners within 600 feet of the premises. Multi-unit buildings were posted. Notices were also sent to Sheridan Neighborhood Association, the Northeast Chamber of Commerce Business Association, and Chamber Member Elliot Payne. We have received 49 comments from the community. 41 support this application. Eight are opposed. And their concerns are noise, late night hours, traffic, and on-street public parking. The Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of an on-sale liquor with Sunday sales, with Sunday sales, general entertainment with no conditions. This concludes my presentation. At this time, I will stand for comments or questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff on this application? Seeing none, thank you so much for your report, sir. We'll open the public hearing on item number three. Uh, there are a couple people signed up. You are welcome to step up at any time. State your name and address for the record. You each have two minutes. Um, hello, I'm Hillary Ziamir. I am one of the owners of the Briar. Um, my partner, Abraham Ziamir, is the other owner. And um, we are very thankful of you considering our application today. We have strived really hard over the last two years to revitalize this building, uh, open it back up to the public, and create a community space uh, where neighbors can gather and meet each other. Uh, right now we operate a cafe um, with food 
and adding uh, liquor to that will provide additional programming um, at nighttime. Right now we are closing at 3.30 during the weekday and 4.30 on the weekend. Um, we are planning on um, modifying some of our hours once we have a full license, including the liquor, and also modifying outside hours to accommodate the neighborhood's concerns about um, noise. So during the weekday, the patio will be closing at 9 uh, to accommodate for outside noise pollution. And on the weekend, the patio will be closing at 10, except for Sunday, which will close at 8 when we close. So just be Saturday. Um, with the concern about street parking, currently we see ample street parking during the day for our customers that are using our cafe. Um, nighttime hours with residents coming back to the neighborhood that maybe had driven out for work, still ample parking. Um, we've been monitoring that you know, throughout the last year. We opened late November last year. So just taking photos of different times of the day and how much parking is available on the cross section that we are on, which is 13th Washington. Uh, ample parking in that intersection and then blocks down also parking available. We are on a bus line and have installed several bike racks. So we do encourage pedestrian and Metro Transit as well as biking to get to our establishment. We are a small place, so even if everyone drove a car and we had all 40 seats taken, there'd be 40 cars in the neighborhood. Right. Um, so trying to like mediate that concern. Um, also uh, involved with Logan Park's neighborhood. Uh, I sit on the board there as of recent, a couple months ago. Um, so trying to be available for neighbors to contact me if they do have concerns about activity that's going on at the Briar. Uh, we've also lighted the Briar, the, a corner that recently did not have security lights on it and have installed cameras, which in Logan Park, uh, security is a big issue lately. There's been an uptick in some car theft and vandalism. And so having cameras and a, another lighted corner intersection has been very useful so far in uh, mitigating activity at nighttime in that section. We hope that bringing more foot traffic in at night will also provide more eyes in our neighborhood to help with the safety issues that we're currently talking about on the board. Um, and yeah, I just appreciate taking this moment. We've been working really hard on this project and I'm excited to go to the next step. Thank you so much for being here today. We'll take all the public hearing and then we can move to questions if there are any. Uh, I understand there are two additional people here to speak. You're welcome to speak at this time. Hello, uh, and thank you for hearing our views about the Briar's application for a liquor license and expanded entertainment license. Uh, my name is Derek. Uh, I live directly next door at 628 13th Ave. Uh, with my wife and my 10-year-old daughter. Uh, we've been there for 11 years. Uh, first off, I want to preface my comments by saying that our family supports the 2040 plan. Um, we see housing density lowering the cost to have a roof over your head, and also we en uh, envision a Minneapolis where uh, cars aren't as much of a factor in our lives. Um, we also enjoy uh, having a coffee shop in the neighborhood, um, but unfortunately, the three-year process of the Briar coming to be uh, hasn't really been about a coffee shop. Um, they've always wanted to be a bar from day one, and the surrounding neighbors expressed that they didn't want this to happen by a wide margin when the briar first began uh, the process of trying to achieve a zoning change. Uh, now that the 2040 rules are in place, I think it's important to state a few basic facts about the briar property. Uh, in previous incarnations, uh, it has been a corner store, an upholstery shop, and an artist's studio. Uh, it's also a very small parcel. Uh, in fact, if you measure out the required 20 feet from the property lines, uh, you're left with a patio space of about 20 feet by 15 feet. Um, you know, the applicant has trumpeted restoring this commercial space, uh, but it's never been a bar or restaurant before. It's always been a quiet nine to five space. And shoehorning a bar into this property just doesn't mesh in my mind with the neighborhood and the immediate neighbors shouldn't have to bear the burden of their investment risk. Uh, we don't know if you will approve the liquor license. We definitely oppose it, but we ask that you consider the following. Uh, foisting a bar with a patio into a quiet, quiet residential 
uh, area is just bad governance. It puts the onus on the residents to complain about noise issues, uh, results in residents being unable to open their windows at night. Uh, it means that you get sidewalks covered in cigarette butts. Uh, it also means that you might not be able to sleep when you need to. Um, it's like having a neighbor um, next door that invites friends over to their yard for a party every night. And I'm not being flippant about this, but I would ask you if you would want to live next to that neighbor. Mr. Taylor, yeah. um, unfortunately your two minutes are up, but I'm just curious, has all, have all of these terrible things happened already? It's not a bar right now. It's a but coffee shop. you don't shop. know that that would happen. I've been to many bars in my life. Um, I just, uh, just to sum up, I ask, you know, just a few things. One, um, that you weight the responses from neighbors more than um, you know, people who are patrons, because they're not, uh, re they're not replying to you about the impacts of a bar t to their neighborhood. They don't have a, uh, an impact in this situation. Um, I ask that you look at the entertainment license because a general license gives them way too broad of an ability to uh, hold concerts and such in that tiny space. Um, and I just ask that you limit their hours to what they have defined um, so that it can't creep in the future and be expanded. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Please uh, state your name and address for the record. Hi. Uh, my name is Paige Latham Dodora. I'm a resident of Ward 8. I live at 3908 Park Avenue. Um, so we're here today to give remarks about whether or not an existing business, the Briar, should be granted a new liquor license. And I think some factors to consider uh, are what impact the license would have on the business and what impact the license would have on its neighbors. I've known Hillary for over 10 years and Abe for almost as long, the owners. I know many of the people that are employed by the Briar, and I also understand some finer points of running a small business. I've worked in the hospitality industry and I've worked and taught within the beer industry. First, let's put the interests of the neighbors first since that's what Hillary and Abe would do. People who live nearby the Briar may be concerned about parking, safety, and noise, but what I know about the plans that Hillary and Abe have is that the Briar is never going to be a boisterous, closing time sort of bar. The goal is to serve sophisticated cocktails along thoughtful food. And the fact that the Briar has already been operating as a cafe serving breakfast and lunch has already set that precedent. Customers will most likely not be visiting for the purposes of getting drunk, being loud, and staying out late. Second, the dining room and patio are very small, as everyone has said. When I have visited, even when it's very busy, I've never had difficulty parking within several feet of the front door, and I have certainly never seen restaurant, or residents have trouble parking, and many people do walk or bike, especially when they're bringing um, kids or dogs. When it comes to safety, Hillary is an extremely seasoned member of the industry. During her days coordinating the Dangerous Man volunteers or serving in the Dangerous Man tap room, she was constantly vigilant for those around her, and I'm confident she'll ask her staff to do the same. Neighboring business Northeast Social is similar in concept and has been operating since 2009 and is a welcome staple in Logan Park. Taking the interests of the Briar into account, a liquor license is key to the success of the business. As we all know too well, including myself included, the effects of the pandemic has meant that restaurants are struggling not to thrive but just to survive. And providing liquor is critical to meeting the needs of their customers and capturing interests in their neighborhood. They've bootstrapped themselves to make it this far, and it's time to give them an assist in continuing to serve their neighbors and employ members of their community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is there anyone else here who would like to testify? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. It sounds like Council Member Rainville has some questions of staff. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Ms. Lingo, welcome. Ms. Lingo, hello. Hello. So I've had several questions, uh, emails uh, from residents about the noise and the hours operation. Are, are you comfortable that uh, the applicants for this are, are sensitive to that, that they've uh, addressed those concerns? I am. The hours that they have listed on their application are what we would definitely consider to be reasonable for the use and for the area. Um, as you all know, with an on-sale liquor license, they can apply for up to 2 a.m. and they have elected to go with the much earlier hours. Um, and then we would follow any standard noise um, complaint issues that we would have. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, I have a question for one of the owners. Um, okay. Yes, hi. So, hi, it's good to see you again. Yes, nice to see you. Uh, I, I know you realize how different uh, your use is 
from the past for this building. Yes, and it was empty for, well, not empty, but not active for quite some years before we purchased it. Um, so it has been very quiet. And, uh, um, you know, even during the pandemic, when we started working on it, you know, again, isolation. So there wasn't a lot of activity around that area now, too. Right. And, and now it'll be more active and the neighbors are concerned. So do, how do you get along with the neighbors? Yeah, well, it seems like from so far, the lighted corner and the cameras have actually already come in handy. We've been asked to look at our footage to see if there were any incidents of someone's car got broken into across the street. They wanted to see if there was a video of that. Someone dumped a whole pile of garbage in a neighbor's yard. They wanted to see if there was a video of that. Previous to us being there, these videos would not have been available. And then also the graffiti and these few incidents that happened right away when we had the cameras up have declined. There hasn't been any more requests for such things because the incidents haven't happened to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, we also haven't been tagged or been graffitied on. Previous to this, the building was graffitied on quite a lot. Um, and I like to think that the lighted area, especially with the bus stop there, helps prevent crime for people waiting for the bus and also for people just seeing a derelict building kind of unlit and not supervised. Great. And, well, and one last question. So, so the noise will be an issue. As you said, it's been a pretty passive. It was an artist's studio, and before that, it was an upholstery shop, which closed at 5 o'clock. Yeah. Right now, we, we do not plan on, or are we, having any amplified music outside, either through speakers or otherwise. Um, inside, we have a sound system. Um, we replaced all the windows and doors with sound in mind dampening as much sound as we could. Everything, all the windows and doors are new in there for sound dampening purposes. Um, when, if this license gets approved, we don't plan on pumping any music to the patio. So no like speakers out there to disturb the neighbors. Um, the extended license really is for if we host community events or if we're doing a private wedding or a party where there may be a DJ or dancing, we want to make sure we're in compliance and not violating any of the codes which those fall under. Um, we are part of Northeast, and there is Art World, which is a big community activity for Northeast. And we want to also be able to invite artists and musicians, if they so choose, to perform in our space during that time and the extended entertainment license would allow us those opportunities. We don't plan on hosting large concerts or amplified concerts of any kind because we are so small and it would dramatically affect that neighborhood if there was a concert shoved into our space. Um, because again, we only have space for 40 people to sit and so if we're putting a large band in there that is taking up some of those spaces. So again, we're shrinking how many people can be inside. If we're trying to fit a band in there, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but we wanted to have the license so that we could offer these community opportunities and still be in compliance. Thank you. And again, this is quite a change in use. I've gotten a lot of emails, you know, because I've lived there in that area all my life. So people approach me. And there's very much, uh, I, I call them heightened concerns. And, and this gentleman testified today who lives right next door to you. Uh, you know, being a good neighbor for a business is very, very important. So uh, I, I will be voting for this, but I, I want you to know that if the complaints happen, uh, I will side with the residents. Thank you. Councilmember Ellison. No real questions, just uh, did wanna say I, I have been to this location a few times, and I would say that the the the, the parking is 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 there's significant parking all on every single intersection, and so um, and you know I heard the comments about like cigarette butts and concerts, and again it just didn't seem like a it doesn't seem like a space that's conducive to that, and again I, I think that the owners have spoken to that really well. Um, I don't think it's going to be a concern, but. I also invite you know neighbors to they, they seem very approachable. You all seem very approachable. Thank you for being here today, um, uh, and would invite neighbors to to interact directly. It's a very ex accessible, inviting space. So, um, most importantly, I think that this uh, you know staff is recommending this, and they are well within compliance. And so, I'm going to move for approval uh, of this license. And um, thank you all for being here today. And thank you, Madam Chair. 
Further comments or questions? I, I just want to note also for the record that when we ask the public for comments and that we do public hearings and we have many of them, it's not a poll between how many people vote in favor and how many people vote against. To get a liquor license, you have to meet certain criteria and these applicants meet the criteria. I'll also note, um, I live in a small neighborhood like Logan Park called Bryn Mawr, and we have a restaurant that has a liquor license. It's called La Mesa, and they are immediately next to residents on all sides, and they're open till about 10 o'clock, and they have giant garage door windows that open up to a patio, and um, they've really leaned into the neighborhood, and I think they've survived because of the neighborhood, and it sounds like these applicants are very similar. It's a very small space like La Mesa, and if we want to be a city that encourages entrepreneurship and young people to start businesses, something I've never had the guts to do, we have to give them some leeway in order to allow them to be where they should be. And this is a corner uh, in a commercial corridor. Uh, they meet the criteria, and I don't see how we would say no, actually. I don't see under what circumstance we would say no. But we could, if there is a problem, like loud noise and amplified music and cigarette butts, we could potentially look at revoking their patio license in the future. And that's enough between the getting along with the neighbors to um, take a second look if all of these terrible things come to fruition. And I genuinely hope they don't, because as someone who lives in a small neighborhood like this one, I really want there to be a place where I can walk and where my dog can come, and uh, I think this is going to be in that spirit. So I agree with Councilmember Ellison, and I agree with Councilmember Rainville. If there are concerns, change is difficult, um, but we also want to really support small business owners as well, and this is a perfect example of that. Further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That is approved, and maybe you guys could talk outside since you're neighbors and uh, come to some kind of consensus that everyone is going to be fine. That would be helpful. We'll move then on to item number four, which is uh, another on sale wine and strong beer license for Silver Fern. Mr. Muhammad, welcome back. Thank you, Chairman and Committee, Ma Chairman Goodman and Committee. Committee members, I am Licensed Inspector Akbar Muhammad, Licenses and Consumer Services. I'm presenting an application from the Silver Fern, owned by the Silver Fern LLC. The business address is 114 East Hampton Ave South, located in Ward, in Ward 3. The applicant is requesting an on-sale wine and strong beer, no live entertainment. The proposed hours of operation are for the interior, Monday and Tuesday, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., Wednesday and Thursday, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., Friday, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., Saturday, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., and Sunday, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. They have an indoor seating for 52 patrons. On September 12th, public hearing notices were sent to the residents and property owners within 600 feet of the premises. Multi-unit buildings were posted. Notices were also sent to the Northeast Minneapolis River District, the Nickel Island East Bank Neighborhood Association, and Council Member Michael Rainville. The Licenses and Consumer Services Division recommends approval of an on sale wine and strong beer. No live entertainment, no conditions. This concludes my presentation. At this time, I stand for comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your report. We'll see if there are any questions or comments. Uh, seeing none, I just want to note that Councilmember Chugtai wasn't feeling well, and we didn't think it was a good idea for her to stay in committee if she wasn't feeling well. Uh, we've learned a lot about illness in the past couple of years. So uh, the, the remainder uh, does constitute a quorum of the committee, and I just want to note that for the record. Um, I don't see any comments or questions. We very much appreciate your report. Thank you for being here. We will open the public hearing on item number four and see if there's anyone here to speak to this issue. Is the applicant here? Hello, young man. I don't have your name in Hi. front of me. Please state your name and address for the record. My name is Ben Parcell. I live at 2600 Cedar Green in Hopkins, Minnesota. And excuse me, I am a performer and an ex-teacher, and my heart has never been pounding so fast as it is right now. What kind of performer? Uh, vocal music. Maybe you could Funny sing enough. your comments. 
Yeah. I... That would be so fun. Maybe Try next it. meeting. Yeah. Um, I am here to support the on sale wine and strong beer application for Silver Fern. It's a cafe bakery wine bar. Um, so we're dabbling in a little bit of everything. We open early in the morning for pastries and coffee. We're open for a full lunch, salads, grain bowls, um, sandwiches, the like of that. And then we would hope to transition into a wine bar in the evening offering small plates. Um, we're inspired by the cafe culture of Australia and New Zealand, which focuses on um, spending time in community with each other, enjoying our coffee, enjoying our beverages that we have in front of us. Um, we're focusing on sustainability. All of our coffee comes from a carbon negative roastery, so we're actually planting trees every time you grab a cup of coffee. Um, we're composting and recycling as much as possible. Um, and we're also focused on inclusivity. So in addition to our on-sale wine and beer, we're gonna have a robust non-alcoholic um, program with non-alcoholic wines, beers, and other beverages. We're also focusing on vegan and gluten-free foods so that if a party of four wants to sit down and two of them don't drink alcohol, one of them is vegan, one of them is gluten-free, it's a space where they can spend time together, build community, um, and enjoy themselves. Um, I think you have all of the details of our um, hours and such. Um, we're also already focused on community. We're partnering with uh, our neighborhood association. We already have our first event scheduled with them to provide food. Um, we're also partnering with local businesses to have a place for people to host meetings. Um, so we're excited to join the community and we hope that you will support our on-sale wine license and strong beer. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Yes. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, ben, I'm glad everything worked out with your venting. Uh, it's difficult in those old buildings, new buildings to, yeah. to solve that. So it's very much a pleasure for me to recommend approval today of item number four. And I look forward to uh, your ribbon cutting ceremony. Just let me know in advance so I can be there and help you celebrate. Thank you. Take care. Further comments or questions? Seeing none on Councilmember Rainville's motion to approve, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item is approved. Thank you for being here today. We'll then move on to item number five, which is the 2024 license fee schedule. I understand Ben Zimmerman and Lindsay are here. Not Lindsay Zimmerman, but Ben Zimmerman and Lindsay are here to give this report. Thank you for being here today. This is a new strategy, have finance give us the bad news instead of the licensing staff. <laughs> Clever. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Goodman, members of the committee. My name is Lindsay Erdman, and I'm joined by my colleague, Ben Zimmerman, and we are both budget analysts in the budget division, here to talk to you about the 2024 license fee schedule recommendations. Uh, we will first walk through our context and process for this year, and then <coughs> present you with our recommendations uh, to the 2024 license fee schedule, and then Ben will uh, walk through the regulatory services study. Um, so first, uh, for the why and how. So this is an annual process. The update to the license fee schedule is informed by the Appendix J of the Municipal Code and coincides with the budget process. Uh, budget staff conducts an analysis and presents recommendations to be considered and voted on by Council. Fees have received a base increase four times since 2010, with the last updates in 2019 and then 2020. Generally, this base increase has been a 1.5 to 2% increase across the board, except for PCAR fees, which um, has trended higher in the 3 to 10% range. Our 2024 approach um, is uh, coming from a 2% uh, base increase for all fees. Uh, this is rooted in the historical precedent that I just uh, went over. And additionally, uh, during the 2023 budget process, city leadership indicated they would recommend a modest fee increase in 2024, or for 2024. 
In addition to the base increase, all fees were subject to a $5 minimum increase and were rounded to the nearest $5 increment. Departments also had an opportunity to propose alternative changes to the fees. Many or most of the fees increased at 2%. Some were decreased to adhere to state and city policy, while others were held flat. And we will cover all of this as we move through the presentation. So our final recommendations are brought forward through the lens of cost recovery, ensuring that the city is not over collecting. We felt confident to make these recommendations based on a 2018 fee study, which indicated modest fee increases wouldn't cause over collection. Uh, lastly, a, a, a fee study was conducted in collaboration with regulatory services. Um, this is a retroactive look at expenses and revenues to understand the surplus or subsidy of a division and the corresponding recovery ratio. Uh, in the public comment period, a notification went out to 35, or excuse me, 34,000 license and permit holders, including all businesses and neighborhood associations, council members, and any email that is registered with the license fee system. The city received 20 responses, 14 were opposed, four were neutral, and two were in favor of the changes to the fee schedule. And then today we are here for the public hearing following this presentation required by ordinance. Uh, so there are uh, three departments and five divisions that oversee the 600 fees on the schedule. So the health department has the pollution control annual registration fees, also known as PCAR, um, and the food lodging and pools fees, or FLP. CPED has business licensing, and regulatory services has rental licensing, animal control, or MAC. And a key note about these 600 fees, some fees are used infrequently. Like for example, the exotic bird license in MAC was only issued two to three times, or two or three times in 2022. And some are used uh, thousands of times, like the rental um, licensing uh, fee. So as we talk through these increases, it's important to keep that in mind, that the additional estimated revenue generation is an outcome of usage or frequency and the level or magnitude of the increase. So our overall, our recommended changes to the current fee schedule would have an estimated increase of $719,000. And we'll walk through each of these departments in our subsequent slides. Uh, first is for the CPAD recommendation. The first three columns, the license name, 2020 or department forecast, 2024 recommended forecast are the same as the previous slide and will stay the same throughout the following slides. Um, the estimated change um, is $141,000 uh, for CPED. Um, and 89% of these fees uh, adhere to that 2% um, base increase. Next, we have health. Uh, for PCAR, there is an estimated revenue increase of $184,000. And the, the department, um, Excuse me, this recommendation is reflective of the department proposal for a 6% increase across the board on all fees. And then for food lodging and pool, we see a 2% increase on all of the fees plus the addition of two new fees, which are the hazard analysis critical control plan and then the plan audit for the um, uh, hazard analysis control plan. Uh, next, uh, we have regulatory services. So for rental licensing, um, there is an estimated revenue increase of $374,000. 66% uh, of the fees increased by that 2% base recommendation, and the remaining license, or excuse me, remaining fees increased by about 23% to reflect the level of effort required to conduct rental and commercial inspect inspections. And so we understand that the median of 23% like looks high, and we want just to kind of talk through again that we are speaking about the percentage of fees impacted by the 23% median increase without considering the frequency of collection on impacted fees. So for example, the tier one rental building registration had over 15,000 registrants in 2022, 
and is recommended to receive the base 2% increase, whereas the rental building registration tier three supplemental charge had 35 registrants in 2022 and is recommended to receive an increase of 22%. Um, so that 23% median increase um, does apply to fees that are uncommonly used. So I'm not sure if you would want to have questions as you go through, or do you want to? Uh, would you like to go get to the end of your presentation? Preferably at the end. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, next, uh, for animal control or MAC, uh, the re recommendation is to uh, hold these fees flat. Um, so that would result in no new um, revenue. Um, so again, finance is coming, uh, coming with this recommendation through the lens of cost recovery and ensuring that we're not over collecting. And so while MAC had different considerations like animal welfare and accessibility for establishing fee levels, the role of the budget division is to conduct analysis and thread the needle of what happens on the ground and recommend what level of recovery is appropriate given both of these dynamics. Uh, so with that, um, I will conclude this portion of the presentation on the fee schedule and turn it over to Ben to discuss um, the fee study, uh, which is on Reg services, and perhaps Chair will get at some of your questions as well. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, Chair Goodman, committee members, my name is Ben Zimmerman, um, and I'm here to walk you through the, the fee study component of this. So first of all, why are we doing this? Uh, we are guided by our financial policies. We have Revenue Policy 3.5 uh, summarized on the slide, which essentially states that revenue must not exceed direct and indirect costs of service provision. To get at this, we can use a fee study to quantify an estimated recovery rate, which is comparing revenues uh, relative to expenses. And the recovery rate tells us two things, the percent of uh, costs covered by those revenues, and then conversely, the remainder being covered more broadly by the general fund. Uh, to add some historical context, uh, as Lindsay noted, there was a fee study uh, last conducted in 2018 uh, that was specific to the license fee schedule. At that time, since it was conducted in 2018, it looked at 2017 data to inform 2019 updates. At that time, the fee study confirmed there was no overcollection nor were any of the recommendations going into 2019 uh, posing a risk for overcollection. Uh, the bottom line findings there were that citywide, as it pertains to the license fee schedule, uh, the recovery rate was 46%. So 46% of costs of administration and enforcement were being covered by these fees. Um, from there, the recommendations in 2019 were restructures and increasing to approach closer to 60% citywide recovery. Our methodology this time around, um, since we're in 2023, is a look back at 2022. As you've heard a few times throughout from Lindsay, that recovery rate is the primary lens that we brought to this exercise. And just to re reiterate again, uh, first, that's ensuring we didn't overcollect looking back to last year. And step two, um, ensuring that what we're proposing for next year doesn't pose a risk for overcollection. We were not able to co um, complete a fee study for all departments due to resource and time constraints. So we chose one department, that being Reg Services, uh, with two operational areas, again, MAC and inspections. Um, from there, we estimate a recovery rate range by looking at actual revenues and then both budget and actual expense data. We think looking at both budget and actual can be instructive to understand both what was planned for and actual costs incurred. All right, one slide unpacking a little bit more about the methodology. Uh, the first three bullets here look at explaining how we got to expenses and the final revenues. Uh, the first bullet, base division expenses, these are the primary expenses uh, incurred for implementing the work. It is the division or divisions within the department uh, where this takes place. The expenses uh, categorized there include personnel, which is often the largest, non-personnel for things like contracts or supplies, and allocation expenses, paying for fleet and IT to support the work. The second expense bullet we have is uh, other departmental expenses. Um, the best way to explain this is to point to the fee study and an example within Reg Services. Through the course of the Reg Services uh, fee study, we identified the Operations and Engagement Division as having a few FTEs that spent a portion of their time providing back-end support to these operations. So we wanted to in 
include those expenses into the study. Lastly, we have other city expenses um, looking outside reg services, and this is where, again, pointing to an example might be most helpful. Things like 311 calls being taken for MAC are costs we want to account for in the fee study. The final bullet, the revenues, that's relatively speaking the easier part, at least for this fee study, um, identifying the relevant revenue streams and bringing them into the, the study. So with that, two slides to get to the findings. First for MAC, uh, we'll actually read this bottom to top. So starting with the red bar, that is revenues. We identified about $670,000 of revenue for MAC in 2022. Moving up from there, we have the budgeted expenses of 3.2 million and actuals of 3.6 million. If you compare those revenues to both of these expense figures, again, because they can both be instructive, that um, leads us to a recovery rate of about 18 to 21%. This is right in line with the fee study from 2018 where they identified a rate of 21%. And again, um, with the recommendations we brought today, keeping the, flea, the fees flat, um, we don't anticipate a change to recovery rate when you just simply um, apply it to the 2022 findings. Lastly, I'll move on to inspections. Again, um, follow the slide the same way we did before. Starting with revenues, we identified about 5.5 million um, for the budgeted expenses, 9.2 million, and the actuals, 8.5 million. Again, comparing these figures, we reach a recovery rate range of about 60% to 65%. Going back to the 2018 fee study, at that time, uh, the recovery rate was about 30%, and there were pretty significant restructuring of fees at that time, with the goal of getting a rec recovery rate closer to 55%. So as you can see, um, a couple years out, we're quite close to the goal that was set out in 2019. And going back to the recommendations we provided earlier, um, our estimate would be an increase of about $370,000 in revenue here. And again, taking a simple look at 2022 actuals, uh, we anticipate that would be a couple percentage point increase relative to what we saw there. So while we're at about a 60 to 65% recovery rate in 2022, just a simple look would suggest that being a few percentage points higher in 2024. Uh, lastly, for both MAC and inspections here, um, we observe no risk for overcollection given where the recovery rates stand. Um, to summarize, just real briefly again, um, we outlined our recommendations for the 2024 license fee schedule. This is largely in line with uh, past precedent. We then reviewed the limited scope fee study for reg services and both confirmed there was no overcollection in 2022, nor is there a risk in 2024. Um, I'd like to thank all the departments involved in this because it's a lot of work to get into these figures and, and uh, pull this out. So we appreciate their support in getting this together. Um, and with that, we're done with our presentation and we can turn it over for questions. Are there questions for members of the committee? Um, I understood your report because I remember the days when there was no analysis of <laughs> what the recovery was. And uh, there were a lot of questions about how to handle fees and how much of the work of private um, businesses should be paid for out of the general fund versus what should be paid for by fee recovery. So it's really shocking to see it's going well. I'll use my friends in animal care and control as an example. They probably would like to have you raise fees because they have a lot of work to do. And when their work doesn't happen, animals potentially get euthanized. But the fees don't they have to go for the services that are being provided by those who pay them. So I like to use myself as an example. My dog and my license shouldn't have to pay for healthcare training for other dogs. And so I understand why you're suggesting that. Just like in licensing, um, how well, rental licensing, we don't want the tier one people who are doing well and not having problems paying for the inspections of the tier three people, which is why you've recommended a change, a significant change in tiers two and three, but not in tier two one. Is that correct? That is correct. There are modest increases yes. in tier one, but larger for a tier two and tier Yes, three. that's what I thought. Okay. Um, so I actually think this is really helpful because um, this isn't going to be a question for the courts. You've done the analysis. It's a legitimate analysis. There was a baseline analysis, and uh, your suggestions make sense. Normally, I would not want to vote for any fee increase, but it's hard to argue with your data. Uh, so I will likely uh, vote for it based on the fact that you are extremely well prepared, both of you. Uh, to present this data. I'm really proud that you work for the city and have done such a great job on this. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Griffin. Other comments or questions? 
Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing on item number four, which is the license fee schedule. Um, and I see two people are signed up to speak. You are welcome to speak in either order. You each have two minutes. Mr. Smith, you're welcome. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Cecil Smith. I'm the President and CEO of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. The Minneapolis rental market is facing some serious challenges. We have endured inflationary increases in utility costs, double-digit increases in insurance premiums, material and labor costs that skyrocketed during COVID, new security costs and rising property taxes. But we've had the fourth lowest rent increases since 2020 of all major markets averaging annually 22.2% and only 1.5% over the past 12 months. This is an unsustainable business model. Furthermore, higher interest rates will dramatically affect the cost of debt service as loans mature at some properties in the next few years. Given these economic headwinds, let me turn to the 50% licensed unit fee increase on large tier one properties. The per unit fee has been raised from $10 to $15. For a 100 unit building, this is a 44% increase. For a 300 unit building, this is a 48% increase in the license fee. There are tens of thousands of these units. The city is collecting about 5 million in rental license fees in 2023. The recommendation before you would raise that to over 5.5 million in 2024. That half million dollar increase ultimately lands on renters or while we're tell talking about housing affordability. Let's also remember that Housing Inspection Services is responsible for all housing in the city, nearly 50% of which is owner-occupied, and also pay lower property taxes than renters. They pay no fees, hence the general fund support for housing inspections. A recovery ratio of license fee revenue against expenses at 60% seems more than the fair share for rental homes to cover the cost of inspections. This increase would push that ratio higher, well past the goal of 55%, and seems inequitable to the renters of the city who are poorer and much less white than the homeowners of the city. These disparate impacts on the renter community through higher property tax rates and rental license fees to regulate the entire housing stock, housing stock should be addressed. Thank you for your testimony. Is um, Alec Duncan? Good afternoon, sir. Please Good state afternoon. your name, name yeah. and address for the record. Um, I'm Alec Duncan, 1828 Como Avenue Southeast, Potter's Pasties. Um, we have several food trucks in the Twin Cities, been doing business for 12 years, and uh, um, obviously the one thing that we've noticed is the license here in Minneapolis is one of the most expensive city licenses for a mobile food truck in the nation compared to the population that's here. Since COVID, we've seen an evacuation from Minneapolis itself, whether it's from COVID itself or just uh, the lack of policing that's been going on and the decrease in the amount of police. I've uh, had my trucks vandalized, uh, things stolen, uh, people tried to hotwire them, things like that with zero response from the police. Um, and we're just not seeing the kind of uh, backing and or uh, services or support we feel like uh, we should be getting with doing business in the city to the point where I'm starting to look elsewhere of where to move my business because it no longer makes sense nor do I feel safe doing it within the city itself and I feel like I'm finding it, uh, fighting an uphill battle um, with uh, whether it be the minimum wage with no tips being uh, included in that wage itself um, or uh, increase uh, or it's uh, the license increases that uh, continually go on and, and just the cost of business itself as everyone's mentioned um, inflation uh, you know uh, cost of, of utilities and and um, just overall doing business now Minneapolis everyone keeps saying this is a place for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Now, I, I used to believe that. I no longer believe that anymore. I think it's slowly being bought out by the big boys. And uh, I, I can see it on my front doorstep. Small businesses, especially restaurants and cafes, are, are slowly closing. And while you do find a couple open, I'd say there's you know, five that close for every one that opens. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, um, you're uh, by in, uh, by blanketing the license increase just over everything versus looking at individual basis or uh, various sectors within the licensing itself and saying, well, let's look how, how well this sector is doing versus this sector. 
um, is really uh, not a way to, to be inviting to quote unquote small businesses. That's all Thank you. Mm-hmm. Is there anyone else here to speak to this issue? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. I have a couple of questions for, for Ben and Lindsay based on the testimony. So maybe I don't know who can answer, but we'll, uh, we'll start with what is the increase for a permit for the, a food truck? Chair Goodman, committee members, I would have to. Defer oh, Ms. Lingo, to you. sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I have the chart here. So the increase for the food truck license, it went from 850 to 865. Okay, so it's a 2% increase. And it, the purpose of the license is not to, for police and that kind of thing, but it's for the regulation required uh, in order to make sure the food truck is a safety, uh, health safety issue. Correct, correct? it's both for, for health and for operations from a business licensing okay. standpoint. Thank you. And then um, on the rental license issue, this is probably a stickier question. So are they supposed to go from $10 per unit to 12, but you round it up to 15? And then it's multiplied by 100? Chair Goodman, committee members, yes. So Yeah, well, that's unfair. So the process, uh, again, to, to go back to what our process was for this increase, was to follow the historic precedent of the, the base increase of 2%, rounding to the nearest $5. But you're increase. rounding up by more than 50, 100%. This is correct by definition of the process we took. Um, there are many fees which are under a certain threshold whereby if you don't um, force a minimum $5 increase at some point, you can go for a very long stretch of time with no change. Um, and so at this time, given across the board increases in costs, our baseline approach across the board and starting point for this process was that uh, 2% increase uh, routing to the nearest $5 increment, minimum of $5. And at that point, that was the baseline. Then we turned it over for departments for review and recommendation if there should be changes or if that baseline should be upheld. Well, I guess I'd have to see some analysis that the fee should increase by 33%. Uh, It sounds like your rounding is greater than the fee you're proposing. In fact, it is. If the the fee would be $2, but your rounding would be $3, so the minimum is really, so why don't you just admit the increase you're asking for is 33%? Well, so Chair Goodman, committee members, we tried to speak to that in the slide Lindsay presented explaining that these percentages, and we tried to call it the median percentage, but they can be skewed and challenging to speak to, especially when you're talking about these much smaller dollar figure amounts. Um, But what you're saying is accurate. It is a larger percentage increase relative to the baseline. Um, That is correct. Okay, great, thank you. I'm not gonna move that forward, just so you know, because I don't think that's justifiable, and I think other people would step in and say they don't wanna raise rental license fees either for all sorts of other affordable housing reasons. And I might have been fought that, but when the when the rounding is greater than the amount you're suggesting and then you multiply it by um, you know, a common bond building in Seward, you're talking about a significant increase. I just wanna make sure I understand that. And it sounds like I do. Correct. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions for staff? Council Member Ellison. I uh, don't want to put uh, the uh, our director, CPED director, on the spot, but just wondering. The I know that we get some, we get some, the, we get some input. Uh, your your department gives some input on this, uh, uh, correct? And so, just wondering if there's a way to resolve this. It feels like we're sort of being asked to pick between zero percent and thirty three percent, and just feel and uh, and uh, there's got to be a better solution than that. I would assume. So, just wanted to see if you had any insights on how we could take this up or how we got to this figure uh, before we move forward here. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Council Member Ellison, are you speaking of a housing rent, a rental license? That would be reg services. Yes. My apologies. Yeah. Yes, that is reg services. Yeah. Well, then I'll follow up on that question after. Uh, I know we have the, yeah. we, we're, we're taking this up today. Um, if Mr. Velasquez, if you're able to answer, that's fine. If not, uh, we, can, we can take it up later. But just thought I would uh, ask the question so that we're not, because it feels like we're again we're choosing between 33 percent and zero percent and i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to move the rental licensing forward without recommendation to see what we can work out in the next two week cycle that sounds good 
I, I don't think it would be fair with Mr. Velasquez's hearing to have that hanging over his head, give us the right answer, we'll vote for you, give us the wrong answer, we won't kind of thing. I, don't know. I wasn't proposing I don't like that, that quite, but yeah, I feel you. That, I mean, that maybe not with the four of us, but. That's, that sounds good. <laughs> okay, so um, you, you, I guess we'll see if anyone else has any questions. Okay, seeing none, I am going to move forward the staff recommendation minus the rental license fee for tier one properties, specifically. Not tier two and tier three properties, they cost a lot more to deal with. I think there's some unanimity about that up here. Um, and we will work with you to determine what the appropriate 2% increase actually is for tier one rental properties that is not where the rounding error is greater than the increase. Um, further comments or questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item is approved. Thank you for being here, you guys did a great job. Now we'll move on to the land transfer, 2931, 2937 Bloomington Avenue to the Red Lake Band of Chippewa. Uh, and Mr. Knace is here, thank you for being here. Good afternoon, thank you for having me, Chair Goodman and Council Members. I'm Kevin Kanais, I'm a supervisor with CPED's Residential and Real Estate Development Division, and I'm honored to be here to recommend the transfer of two city-owned properties at 2931 Bloomington and 2937 Bloomington Avenue to the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians. 2931 Bloomington Avenue was previously owned by the city, was sold to Sherman Associates in 2007 for a development that never materialized, and 2937 Bloomington was acquired by Sherman privately around that same time. In 2022, city staff engaged with Sherman Associates on reacquiring 2931 Bloomington and new acquisition of 2937 Bloomington Avenue for $80,000 combined. In February of 2023, that acquisition of both properties was completed. During this time, the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians was also in conversation with the Health Department about rehabilitating their commercial building, which is just north of these two properties, and that building is at 2929 Bloomington Avenue. Red Lake is rehabilitating their property to provide culturally specific community services and would activate the vacant properties by creating a community healing garden to support those services for community members. Longer term plans for the properties include development of a healing center with a possible housing component. To support that vision and the use as a healing garden, staff are recommending the transfer of the properties to Red Lake and a write down of their value to $1 each. With that, I'm happy to take any questions that you have, and I know that folks from Red Lake are here to also speak of the significance of these ac actions for Red Lake Nation and for the city. Thank you, Mr. Knais. We'll see if there are any questions for you. Uh, seeing none, thank you for being here today. I'm going to open the public hearing on item number six. I understand there are a number of people from Red Lake here. Perhaps one person could speak and everybody could stand with them because you're all essentially going to say very similar things and then we won't have to use the timer and cut, start cutting people off as they're in an emotional moment. Um, it is an emotional moment to turn land back. It is an emotional moment to acknowledge that this is a land transfer. It's a big deal. And so I don't wanna make light of it, but it would be great if all of the Red Lake Nation members who are here just stood up together and appointed a couple of people to say something. Um, I invite you to do so now. If we had all Red Lake here, we wouldn't fit. <laughs> I can read your names, Fred, Sherry, Adriana, Marissa, Henry, anyone else? I'm a Red Lake girl standing with you guys. Jump up, <laughs> why not? Buju, Nene Wogi Kwewog, Anishinabe, Dug Washamogan, and in the Go, Makwa, and do a day Moga Kaning and Nunjaba. You may win any Ayano Manungam, Niwi Kagwe, Jimogong, Go, Mani Do, Dagaba Zindin, Anishinabe. So my name is Fred Dejarli in English and Lightning Man in Anishinaabe Moan. I'm from Red Lake, that's where I was born and raised. I'm from the Bear Clan. And I'm here today on behalf of our 
Red Lake Nation and also our program, which means uplifting our relatives. And I want to really emphasize how much um, the importance of our, uh, our, our place in the community is, is, is Anishinaabe people, Dakota people, indigenous people, and our presence there and what we stand for. Our relatives on all planes um, are important to us. So our goals, we're, we're ultimately sharing together here today, and I wanted to open up in the language on behalf of our, our program and our nation. So miigwech for letting me do that, and I'll turn it over to Sherry. So boujou, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sherry Goodwin. I'm the executive director of Obumendwa Gadanaway Manidug. So we're really thankful and honored to be here today. And also we think it's a unique opportunity for us to work together with the relatives in the community, with the community members to uplift that neighborhood. We know it is a hub for different substance use disorders, for mental health issues, for homeless. And we believe that being there right with our relatives by providing services with the culture at the forefront that we can help with this epidemic and help our relatives heal once and for all. So we're really grateful again to be here today. And we are proven that we want to get things done. We have a lot of projects that we've worked with the city on, including Minobamadazin, amongst other um, properties. So miigwech, and it's a good day to be here. I don't know, Adriana, you want to add anything, please? Yeah, Buju, um, Adriana Goodwin, Indigenous Cause, Miskwagami, Wizagagani, Ndunjaba. Greetings, everyone. My colonized name is Adriana Goodwin. Um, <laughs> speaking really fast, um, uh, miigwech for Fred and for Sherry uh, for speaking and just really wanting to um, talk about the significance of this moment and land back. If we take a look to the left of us, this is a picture of Awamniami before, um, before colonization. And as Indigenous peoples, that's something that we always talk about, what it was like before. And so this land transfer of MH347 and MH348 back to the Red Lake Nation, um, this is an opportunity for us to reclaim that little bit of space here in the city of Minneapolis, um, a, a space that, that's meaningful to us, where we can incorporate our culture, incorporate our language, and reclaim who we are as, ind in, as Indigenous peoples. So this is a monumentous day um, for us to be able to have land back, to be leading the way um, as Red Lake Nation, and be, to be able to partner with the city of Minneapolis to make this happen. Um, and we look forward um, to future collaborations, future um, relationship building um, with all those that are here. And so, um, chimigwech, chimigwech. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak of this land transfer? Seeing none, I'm gonna call on Council Member Chavez. Thank you, Sherry Goodman. I'm just super excited about this land transfer, 2931 and 2937 Bloomington Avenue South in Ward 9 that is going to the Red Lake Nation. As an important form of decolonization, this body can take today. And I think it's an important moment. We can all recognize that this it's something that needed to happen a long time ago, and it's something that needs to continue going forward. Uh, this form and this vote we're taking today is land back. That's what it is. We're doing land back here in the city of Minneapolis, and it's something that should be celebrated, not only in Minneapolis, but across the nation. And many of you know that East Phillips has one of the largest urban indigenous communities in the entire country. And this could be a model for all of us to keep moving as a way across the United States after the colonization that the United States government and the United States in general enacted on Native people. I'm very excited to hear about the plan. I saw it all over the news. I've been reading the RCA about the community healing garden and the potential long-term plan for the healing and opioid treatment center that can happen here. That's something that is very desperately needed in this part of South Minneapolis and something that our community members um, can help build uh, and be very proud of. So just here to be very supportive of this and happy the work that you all here in the Red Lake Nation have done along with our city staff to make this day possible. It's something that uh, we're really proud of and wanna make sure that we can all be supportive in the, in the pathway forward. Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just want to uh, co-sign uh, Council Member Chavez's words um, and uh, not sure if, did you make a motion? Mm -hmm. Okay, he made the motion, good. Uh, just making sure. Um, I saw, when this first was announced, I saw that there was a headline that said that the, the city of Minneapolis was giving this land. Uh, and I saw a comment 
uh, that said that the, the the correct word would be returning, and uh, and I, I felt like that was a really pointed um, point to make. That this is sort of an I view this as a, as a good step, but also an obligation uh, that the city uh, needs to needs to meet, uh, not as uh, not as charity, not as anything that we are gifting to you all that you didn't already earn and deserve. And so thank you so much uh, for being here uh, to. Um, receive this land transfer um, and, to, and to, 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 to allow us uh, to return this land. So thank you and uh, I'll be supporting the motion from Council Member Chavez. Council Member Anvil. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, coming down, you coming down today to City Hall. It's not always easy to do this during the day. And I wanna tell you how much I support this effort. I will be voting yes for it. I'm particularly impressed about your efforts to address the opioid addiction that is so necessary and to be culturally specific is the way to go. So thank you for that extra work uh, and I really appreciate it. Let me know what I can do to help. Thank you. For the record, I only drove down, they live here, they live here, like I'm just an outsider, they know that we here better than me, just like anyone else, so thank you. Thank you, there are no outsiders here in the room. Everybody is an outsider. Think about it that way. Um, Council Member Chavez's motion to approve, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That is approved and thank you for taking the time to come down today. We will then move on to our last public hearing item which is the appointment of Enrique Velasquez as the Director of Regulatory Services. Um, I will ask Mr. Velasquez to come down and uh, he can say a few words if he'd like at the beginning and then we'll open the public hearing. I'd like to get a show of hands of how many people are here to speak to this public hearing. Okay, handful and I'm not sure if Lisa has a list. Uh, we will work through the list as well. Mr. Velasquez, welcome. Thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members. I'm Enrique Velasquez, the Interim Director of Regulatory Services. I'm grateful and honored to stand before you today as the nominee for the position of Regulatory Services Director. I wanna thank Mayor Fry from the moment I entered business licensing and worked alongside the mayor's office uh, and many of my peers across the enterprise as we navigated together through a pandemic, through civil unrest and economic recovery efforts, his faith was unwavering. That faith continued following my appointment as Director of Inspection Services, where the stellar staff worked tirelessly to reduce the backlog of proactive inspections that were left dormant during the pandemic, a backlog that will be recovered by the close of 2024. That confidence was unshaken. I give thanks to my peers across the enterprise and from many communities we serve who have supported me along the journey and voiced their support for my nomination. You have all taught me so much and given me higher purpose in the mission critical work we do together. Prior to my time in the city, I spent more than 15 years in the private sector where I oversaw global customer experience, customer operations, and new product development, each through various stages of my career. During my time in the private sector, I led an effort to bring forward a democratic election in a developing nation by implementing a national ID system for all its citizens. This should have been celebrated and rejoiced as a monumental achievement that gave people voice to exercise their own agency. It was not. Internally, this was a bet that paid off as staff shifted attention to the next big bet so that we could earn dividends for the shareholders and make payroll. While I love the impact that my work held on communities around the world, it was in this moment that I realized my heart truly belonged in public service. And I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to do good works that will have lasting effect for the people we serve because it's the right thing to do. Thus started my career with the city of Minneapolis seven years ago. I first joined Public Works Service Water and Sewer Division where I continued to grow and expand capabilities, improve operational effectiveness and increase stewardship of public trust. Next, I served in community planning and economic development where we continued to return value to our stakeholders, not shareholders, our stakeholders, by reducing barriers for business owners to create, maintain, 
and expand wealth generating opportunities through a pandemic, through civil unrest, in the aftermath of the murder of Mr. Floyd, and through economic, <sighs> economic recovery efforts, I stood beside our businesses and our small business owners to find ways to get to yes while upholding state and local regulations. As I continued to grow, I was increasingly able to lead efforts that yielded change, real change for the people of our city. I firmly believe that life in life, things happen for a reason. And I am here today on purpose. The experiences I have had in my life have made me uniquely qualified to lead regulatory services at this time. Chair Goodman, I, I see you're nodding for affirmation because I know you know. Regulatory Services is a small yet dynamic organization of leaders, thinkers, doers across the four divisions of animal care and control under the leadership of Director Caroline Harefield, Traffic Control and Code Compliance under the leadership of Director Ahmed Adao, Operations Engagement under the leadership of our Interim Director Jessica Stone, and inspection services, my former division under the interim direction of Patrick Hilden. This powerful team delivers results that matter to the people who live in, work in, do business in, and visit our great city. We engage community through mission-driven partnerships that uphold our goal of developing a vibrant, safe, and healthy city for all. It's not lost on me that our approach to unsheltered homelessness will be at the center of this work. Our work as I engage with peers across the enterprise and external agencies for support. I understand the importance of having a collaborative, coordinated, and human-centered approach. This work is a source of passion, hope, and optimism for me personally. As a young man in high school, my mother passed away, succumbing to her own battle with mental health. I found myself alone. It was my school, my community, my friends who helped sustain me and propel me onwards to college. When I left for college, I took every single thing that I owned, never to return. It was there that I hoped and was determined to change the path I was on to become something. Regrettably, I had to leave school early due to financial hardships. Most of my belongings were placed in storage. I took what I could carry on my back and headed for the Amtrak station, not knowing where I was going to go. All I knew was I couldn't be here. That train and $96 that uh, that ticket cost me took me to St. Paul. Along the way, I made friends who helped me get set up in the Twin Cities. The next day after arriving in, in the Twin Cities, I applied for and started working at my first job and committed to be off the couch and out of the way within weeks. Fast forward a few months, I had my own apartment, mine. I earned a promotion at work for my work and my dedication and purchased my very first car, a car that I used to drive all the way back to school to get the rest of my things so that I could begin my new life. It would take 10 years to pay off that college debt, but pay it off I did. One drop of water at a time surely does fill the bucket. Debts paid, I was able to restart college, graduating with honors with a bachelor's degree in business administration with a concentration in project management in under two years. I then continued my pursuit of higher education where I earned an MBA with a focus in nonprofit management. I have witnessed firsthand the decay of a loved one as their mental health stability eroded before my eyes. Feeling powerless, I did all the little things to lessen that pain, minimize the anger whenever they were not able to get out of their own way. I experienced abuses of all fashions and emerged stronger, more resilient, and with a determination to do good, to see the humanity in every single person and treat all with respect. And that's what I intended to continue to do for the city 
of Minneapolis and all of its residents. I can never repay the kindness shown to me. I can never, ever repay it. What I can do is demonstrate that the investment others have made in me throughout my life was not for vain. For this reason and more, I serve our great city, seeing people for who they are and the incredible potential they possess. While it may not seem plausible, that individual we encounter today, quiet, withdrawn, and doing everything within their power to just hold on and hold their life together with the right support, encouragement, and care may develop into the Director of Regulatory Services for tomorrow. Thank you, Chair Goodman and committee members for this monumental opportunity. This concludes my presentation and I gladly stand for any comments or questions you all may have. Thank you. Um, Mr. Halaska, since it looks like all of the seats are taken, why don't you come back to your spot here and we will start the public hearing. Um, I have John Williamson followed by Nicole Mason, Kenny Bloom, Paul Mc McChesney, and Christine Crabtree, and then Amy Lingo, and then there could be others who have not had an opportunity to speak. We'll take after that. You each have two minutes, starting with Mr. Williamson. And we'll ask the clerk to run the clock. Yes, thank you, sir. Please state your name and address for the record. John Williamson, 3608 Park Avenue South. Welcome. Um, so a year and a half ago, Rake Services took over encampment response. This was announced to much fanfare. It was a new homeless response team. What, honestly, can any of you say has come of that? We have 150 people living in the mud in the East Fellows. And I didn't hear anything about encampments. I didn't hear anything about our neighbors who are in the mud, who do not have sufficient bathroom facilities. I wish I could say that I have any confidence that this will be a change that will result in a better response from the city, but I do not. I, we had 21 families over north who were displaced because their landlord was not willing to do the maintenance that he needed to do. And here we are now, supposed to expect that this person is gonna be someone who is taking a human-centric human approach to our neighbors who are suffering. I don't believe it. I would like to be wrong. The enterprise has failed our, our, our residents. The enterprise has repeatedly failed our most vulnerable native and black neighbors. You need to step up. You need to do more. Land back is good. South side of Evo is, village is good, but it is not enough. We are not doing this according to some schedule of press conferences and self-congratulation up there on the dais. We need results. Um, Ms. Nicole Mason. Um, hi, I'm Nicole Mason. I'm the organizer of the Nenokasi Healing Camp. And I also wanted to say that I didn't hear anything about encampments either. We have over 150 relatives there, like Thursday said, in the mud. They are going to the bathroom in bags. Okay, disposing of them, and we are begging for porta potties. I have made many emails. I know all of you have gotten that one. I have made phone calls, and I've had council members out there. And I'm not the only one making these calls for porta potties for them. And no response. You come on over and shit in a bag. Not one thing did you say about encampment response when we have all of our indigenous people over there outside. There is no beds for them. You evict us, there's nowhere for them to go. You tell me when we call when there's a wrong person's name and it's somebody that don't even, don't even work for the city anymore. What about bell lofts? You made some poor decisions there, didn't you? Are you gonna make them same poor decisions with our people out here that are houseless and in encampments? 
I don't, com I, I, I don't trust in that. I don't trust in your ability of working for our people here in the city. You are handpicked by the mayor, but not voted in by the people. You guys have to start listening to the people. Even if you kick everybody out, there is nowhere for them to go. There are not enough beds. And then Okasi, what we have in homeless people there, that's not even everybody that's homeless in Minneapolis. So see the broader picture, having a safe place for these women, elders, I have an elder there that we can't even get into anywhere because there is no services. And we have all of the workers, outreach workers coming in. Thank you, Ms. Mason. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it's Kenny Bloom. Is there someone with the last name Bloom? Uh, we'll move on to Paul Mc McChesney. Welcome. It's McCluskey. Ah, McCluskey, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm not the best at reading him. No, uh, it's, yeah. Uh, I live in Powderhorn Park, and I'll give you my address after a bit. Um, I have been helping at uh, the camp that Nicole is speaking of and several before that. Uh, not part of any organization, just some friends who collect donations and uh, bring what we can. And my, uh, my good friend uh, who, who does this too uh, specializes in simply sitting and talking and hearing these folks, uh, and they just love that. that. Uh, all I will need to say is that, yes, uh, Nenakazi has uh, done wonderful things, and I would almost say it's a model for these. There needs to be organization. There needs to be a place where people can stay and feel secure for a while so that the helpers, agencies, do not lose track of them. And that is the case at this camp. And it's got organizers, and it's got people taking care of things, and people chasing people out if they should not be around. And they have also uh, helped get a lot of people to treatment and housing. So uh, all I will say is, by the way, my jacket still smokes from the fires <laughs> during the rain Saturday night when we were over there helping. I didn't realize that until I got here. Um, uh, but yes, please, please find a place in this city that is not used for anything else especially, set it up so that people can stay there. We it bring the port potties, pick up the trash. The rest of us will do the rest. We'll bring the stuff, we'll watch over people, and I hope that you will consider that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, sir. Christine Crabtree, welcome. Thank you. Um, greetings, Chair Goodman and committee members. My name is Kristen Crabtree. I'm a resident of Ward 9. I'm here today to speak on the appointment of Enrique Velasquez to Director of Regulatory Services. According to the August 28th Star Tribune piece, Mr. Velasquez's appointment, uh, about his appointment, his approach to encampment response is not likely to change from current practice and cites that camps may be cleared if health and safety concerns arise. The existence of encampments is a result of health and safety concerns, not the cause. Encampments themselves are not a, pu a public health crisis. They are evidence of a public health crisis. When I refer to the public, I'm referring to all of us, housed residents, unhoused residents, small business owners, all alike. While I agree with direct Interim Director Velasquez that there is no one-size-fits-all response, the reality is that waste removal, bathrooms, and washing stations are critical components of public health. Not providing these basic services does harm to all residents, housed and unhoused alike. The unwillingness of the city enterprise thus far to provide these resources to residents perpetuates health and safety concerns and serves as a wedge pitting our most vulnerable populations against one another. It is inhumane and a dereliction of responsibility to impacted neighborhoods. Providing these services increases livability and is a responsive step towards treating the problem as the problem rather than human beings as the problem. I urge you to remember unhoused residents are residents too. Interim Director Vasquez and I have communicated via email in light of his current role, and I'm working to it, and I am working to address the impacts of unpet, unmet needs in our community. Interim Director, I heard your address, and it seems we share very similar life, lived experiences. I hope 
that this translates into action and stewardship of trust with all residents. It is critical that regulatory services is held accountable by the council members on this days to meet the needs of all community, especially our most marginalized, particularly in light of this body's recognition of racism as a public health crisis. Thank, Thank you. you. Aaron Johnson is next. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. If you could state your name and address for the record, sir. Hi, I'm Aaron Johnson. I am a resident of 8th Ward. Um, I'm actually officially here as media, but because I am covering a lot of the stuff in the encampments, I heard some things that really kind of, I just wanted to add what I personally, like a testimony, um, because I also didn't hear anything about the encampments. And with regards to Nino Casa specifically, they are prioritizing and protecting women um, vulnerable people, and especially disabled people like me. Um, a recent statistic that I read, excuse me, has said that upwards of about, well, an estimated 57% of unhoused and sheltered people are disabled. When you think about, I was disabled by a COVID stroke in the very beginning of the pandemic before we even knew what it was. I am nearly four years later with no benefits, no income, and it's by grace of God that I'm still on my feet. I have a landlord that is in disability law. Excuse me, it's very complicated, but my butt should be in a camp, and I'm a good person. And so these ideas that they're just criminals and drug addicts is like Reagan-era um, thinking, and I just want to advocate for this camp. It's saving lives. I've seen it. They're getting people in treatment. They're helping people. They're feeding people. And that's all I got, excuse me. Thank you for being here, sir. We can get you a chair if you need one. Okay, uh, Ms. Lingo, welcome. Thank you, Chair Goodman. Uh, my name is Amy Lingo. I am the manager for business licensing. Um, I am a resident of Minnetonka, Minnesota, but only from the past three years. I have spent the last 17 years but prior to that, living and working in the city of Minneapolis. And I'm here to speak on behalf of um, Interdirector. Uh, Enrique Velasquez. I worked with him for three years. He was the manager for business licensing prior to my tenure. And um, no man is an island. No man is responsible for the entire government. But I would like to say that he has a very collaborative and interactive approach. And he finds it very important to get to yes, you stole my line. Um, and he is very into working with staff and working with community and balancing that line between policy and good faith and effort and what needs to be done and sometimes what needs to be done and what is done is leaves a bad taste in everyone's mouth but you know the policy is what we have to do um, and I find that in working with Enrique with his collaborative style and his linear leadership style he allows staff to be empowered to make decisions and to make the change from within. Change from without and activism is very important, but you also need to empower staff to be able to make the changes from within so that we can work with the policy that is set through the council. And I find that interim director does do that and with his increased position would be able to do that at a greater level. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to testify today? Anyone? Anyone? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I did have a few uh, questions for Interim Director Velasquez, and um, welcome to stay on the dais or, or, or uh, come to the podium. Um, one thing I wanted to start out by saying is that, uh, well, first I wanted to um, thank the folks who came to talk about both encampment policy to lift up bell lofts. I think those are really important things for us to talk about, the really important stories for us to tell. Um, I do, uh, I am gonna be supporting Mr. Velasquez today, but I also wanted to talk to him about some of those issues because I think that the public is owed some answers to, to the questions that they've received. Um, but I did, I'd be remiss, you know, this is an institution that sometimes can resent and punish folks who lend voices of dissent and so to John, who I, Nicole, did you refer to them as Thursday? 
Uh, I want to make sure I'm addressing them the way that they want. But to, to Thursday, Nicole, Paul, Kristen, Aaron, I want to thank you for your voices today because I think it's really important. And I don't want this to be an environment where people cannot lend their voices, even when it's tough, even when it's difficult, and even when it's things that people don't want to hear. Uh, to Mr. Velasquez, uh, a few things that I want, a few questions I wanted to ask specifically to Bell Lofts, just because that happened in my ward, and I know that it happened in the winter. Uh, it happened. Um, right after I had gotten surgery, actually, and throat surgery, and I couldn't speak, and I had to communicate to, to everyone via text. Um, and so I was texting uh, with, uh, with Saray, uh, who was then director of Reg Services, and, uh, and a number of people on the team. Um, one of the things that I think my constituents have been worried about was what were the warning signs, where, you know, um, and so the question I have is, when it comes to things like pipes bursting in a building and our ability to, um, uh, to, to get ahead of that, what kind of information do we rely on? What kind of tools do we use in order to understand what's going, what's going on in a building at that level? All right, certainly. Chair Goodman, uh, Council Member Ellison, thank you for the question. So we rely on a few different aspects. First is the proactive rental license inspection, which Bell Loss was not yet due for until the following year. A uh, second component is uh, complaint inspections, so anything that we, we would receive from constituents, from residents, from neighbors that would uh, telegraph that there might be an issue, either nuisance related or conditional related within uh, common areas or even specific units. Uh, the third aspect is the annual life safety and fire prevention system inspections that as a property owner, they would be required to hire a contractor to perform that work. There's a one year uh, inspection, but then every three years, there's a more comprehensive three year inspection. This building was due for the three year. However, with the uh, property changing hands in the middle of that, the new property owner was not aware that they needed a three year. They got the one year and the issues that uh, would have been found con conceivably uh, would have come up in that three year inspection when we test the pipes and test the uh, amount of pressure that can be received and, and flow through those systems. That wouldn't come up in a one year, which the one year tests um, the lights and tests a number of different components in the back office for the life safety. And, and for clarity, are those inspections that we do as a city or are the, is that third party information that we rely on? That's third party information. That we rely on, yeah. Correct. Uh, one, another thing that I wanted to talk about and just, again, in my experience in dealing with that situation, which is very tough. First off, I wanna say I would never expect, it is reasonable for tenants to be upset with myself, with the department when they're um, housing security is compromised, right? Which is what happened. And so I don't expect any thank yous from folks who had to go through that and had to live through that. At the same time, uh, we did have the uh, uh, kind of newly formed as of 2019, I believe, um, moving fees that we, uh, moving support that we uh, deploy in this kind of situation. What was the timeline of deploying those resources to tenants and uh, what role did regulatory services play when it came to making sure that folks could have access to that? Certainly, with the um, alternative enforcement team, we have renters relocation assistance, which typically that comes into play when we can identify that there was something relating to uh, lack of maintenance or something of that nature that the property and the property owner were not able to keep up. Um, so typically that would be paid by the property owner. What we did in the Bell Loft situation was uh, the city paid it in advance. We felt our case was quite strong that we would be able to recover the costs from the renter's relocation assistance fund for those specific um, fees from the property owner. So we paid it in advance to shorten the time frame. Typically the time frame is two and a half weeks once we have agreement and once all of those um, impacted residents apply for assistance. We wanted to shorten that as much as possible as you mentioned, it was middle of winter. It was uh, New Year's Eve, in fact, when the, the pipe ruptured, I believe. So we're trying to shorten that amount of time that residents were impacted and would be affected and not have any sort of sense of security on what comes next. And thank you very much for, the, for those responses. And I don't say any of that to, to say 
that uh, the experience that those renters had was a great one. It was not. But, um, oh, I guess last question is, aside from rental relocation assistance, which again, we established in 2019, I believe, what other financial tools do we have at a, as a city or as regulatory services to help tenants like, like the tenants of Bell Lofts in, in uh, a situation like the one that they faced? Certainly, thank you for the question. Uh, additional tools that we have are the emergency tenant repair action and tenant repair action. Uh, so we would stand up uh, the TRA board to evaluate whether there's enough just cause for the city to move in and basically pay for the repairs for, for those specific situations. There were no set um, orders to correct or other factors that would elevate this specific example up to the level for an emergency tenant repairs action or tenant repair board review. Um, so that's where evaluating all of the different factors that we had in place that moving forward with the rental relocation assistance seemed to be the most expeditious and the most advantageous for the residents. Thank you so much. Um, feels weird to say because I haven't. I don't feel like I've been in office that long, but I feel like I have seen a fair number of reg, of reg service directors, and I've worked with a number of staff who who in reg services. Uh, and my experience then um, uh, with that situation and since has been that you uh, somebody described you as collaborative um, and responsive, uh, and I would say that that has been my experience with you as well. Um, none of us are above critique. None of us are above improvement. And so that's why the folks who joined us today to, to, to lend their skepticism, their, 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 their disapproval, uh, I thank them because none of us are above that. That's how we improve as an institution. But I also think it's important that we put into perspective that sometimes the tools at um, staff's disposal are not robust enough, are not great enough, and that goes beyond what they can be held accountable. That gets into what we can be held accountable. That gets into what the mayor can be held accountable. And so I just want to say, you know, taking on some personal responsibility, some of, some of what we need to be doing as a city when it comes to equipping reg services directors is passing better policy, passing better policy faster, um, making sure that we have things that are well, make sure that the tools that our staff use are well funded. These are important things that the council and the mayor need to be held accountable for as well. And I just wanted to make sure that that, that was laid out and clear as, as we move forward and, 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 and take up this vote today. Um, I had one other point that I wanted to make. I, 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 you know, I think it's really important as well that um, you know, um, when we are uh, looking at uh, tenants who are in need of service, who are in need of supports, uh, the, the city and the county and, and, and private foundations could also do better to make sure that we are thoroughly vetting folks that we are engaging in partnership with. Uh, I'm not you know, accusing anybody of anything in particular, but I think that you know, we've, uh, we've got to make sure you know, some, folks are, some folks are earnest about their mission towards social justice. Some folks are using social justice as a way to execute a grift. And that, again, not saying what happened in the bell off situation, but I think it's important that that's a step that we take and an analysis that we have and improve on as a city as we're moving forward. So, Mr. Velasquez, thank you so much for, your, for answering my questions. I do want to say, if it's not clear, uh, I really have, uh, 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 I feel like it has been, uh, it's been great being able to work with you uh, through hardships in a department that can be quite thankless. Uh, the work of that department can be quite thankless. Um, and, um, and while I can't predict the future, I do think that voices of, based on what I, my relationship with you so far, I think that voices of dissent are gonna be welcome to you. Uh, I think that um, uh, the critiques are something that uh, you can handle. Uh, and I think that the work of the department um, is something that um, that you are going to be well suited for. So thank you for stepping up to 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 be uh, of service to us in this way, to the residents in this way. Uh, and uh, you've got a partner on the city council at the at minimum uh, when it comes to improving the, the 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 tools that we that you have at your disposal. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison, Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Chair Goodman. I want to thank you, Interim Director Velasquez, for being with us here today. I do got a series of, of questions, and most of it's from communications I've received from constituents over the year, past year and nine months. I also want to thank our residents here. There's a lot of Ward 9 constituents here today. I know you've been helping at the encampment on the 2300 block of, of 13th Avenue South. Uh, appreciate your work there. 
So the first question is mostly in regards to our encampment response from the regulatory services perspective. I want to know how you will address and work with other city departments to ensure that basic trash collection and basic public health measures are being provided at encampments this morning. I can pull it up, but I'm not going to. I got sent a picture of an encampment on the 2300 block of 13th Avenue South. It's trash just piling up. And I think part of the role of regulatory services is having an encampment response policy and working with different departments like Public Works. So I want to know like what your plan is to work with different city departments to make sure that basic public health measures are being addressed. Um, for example, organized trash collection is something that's really important. I think residents have been emailing my office, and while that is not in Ward 9, they have been reaching out to me saying if we can get that picked up. And I think that's really important. And this particular encampment, I think, the last time I checked, has, you know, they've been working on a different model. I think 11 residents have been housed, 11 have chosen to enter treatment, three residents have been reunited with their family. That may be data from days ago, it might have changed, but that's important to understand that they are doing this without any city support. And the city is not, I'm not gonna say they're not helping, because I don't know the full truth if we've been collecting trash or not, but. I'm getting some pictures of it just trash piling up. And I think that's something that needs to get addressed and want to know what your plan as a director of regulatory services to make sure that we can get that fixed. Thank you, Councilmember Chavez. I appreciate the question. Um, I can tell you as, as things stand right now, we do take a collaborative approach to our homeless response. We have meetings internally, cross-departmentally um, with CPED, for example, with Public Works. One of the issues that we are contending with is staffing and staffing availability or staffing shortages. So we're trying to work through those aspects right now to identify how can we stand up a regular schedule of trash cleanup so that we are not contributing to furtherance of public health risks and are instead taking away from those risks. So we're evaluating some different options of do we set a specific date and time? Do we allocate specific resources for that work? Are there opportunities to uh, bring in contractors who could supplement our existing staff? So we are taking a look at each one of those different aspects. Um, and I can say that really all options need to be on the table uh, with respect to our homeless encampment response. Um, we're not focused on just any one avenue. We're not focused on a one size fits all approach as as Ms. Crabtree also spoke to, uh, we need to come with all of the tools and every, every faculty available to be able to respond to not only address uh, the symptoms, but then to really proactively address causes. Thank you, I appreciate it. I guess if anybody's hearing from our city staff, if we can make sure that there's basic trash collection happening right now on that block, it is desperately needed. And in regards to all hands on deck, I hope bathrooms, hand washing stations, public health services are part of that plan because it's what our residents need. Uh, and thank you for that answer. I have four more questions in regards to inspections. So I've been able to, and we had a conversation about this uh, interim director, I've been able to work with many of my neighbors and residents, especially people from diverse backgrounds, speak different languages, uh, some that don't even speak English regarding our inspection response. There's been many instances where we have sent inspectors to different buildings and our inspectors haven't always caught the issues that our residents are experiencing, right? So I wanna know, like, I guess, in this new role, what are some of the strategies and policies you're gonna push to improve that, to make sure that when we are inspecting buildings, that our residents' uh, complaints are being addressed, that they're being looked into, and then how can we be more proactive? And I think that you share a goal, we both talked about that already, but how can we be more proactive in our inspections instead of just relying on a complaint-based system. We know that a complaint-based system inherently doesn't help people that speak different languages. It doesn't help people that don't know how to access our technology that we have. And I think it's important to, you know, when it comes to inspections, that we're more proactive in making sure that we can actually go and ensure that these property managers are being held accountable rather than just relying on tenants who may not always know how to access city government. Absolutely, thank you for the question, Council Member Chavez. Um, one important factor for me is making sure that city services, communications, documentation, whatever it is that we produce and deliver, that it is accessible for all of our residents. Um, not everyone is digitally illiterate or technologically savvy. 
Um, so that can present a barrier for, for certain individuals. Language accessibility is another aspect. So making sure that everything we have is accessible for the individuals. Communicating in a culturally responsive way so that we are not just taking an English document, translating it, and going through typical uh, channels for native English speakers so that others can have access to it. That does not solve the problem, but you're leveraging our existing cultural radio programming, um, working with elders and those within community so that they can also receive messaging and cascade throughout community on how we will uh, engage. Those are very important values for me. Um, with respect to rental housing inspections, I want to make sure that it's clear. We do proactive inspections. We have a set um, cadence of inspections. Tier 1 properties are inspected every eight years. Tier 2 properties inspected every five years. And Tier 3 properties inspected every single year. Um, so we do have that aspect of our inspections work in addition to complaints, in addition to evaluating whatever comes forward from the Minneapolis Police Department and our crime prevention specialists. We leverage as many tools as we possibly can so that we can understand what's happening on the ground um, and be able to resolve those issues as quickly as we identify them and as, as they come up. To your point, we all come with different lived experiences. We come with different backgrounds, and there might be some inherent mistrust or distrust of government when you see someone show up in a uniform or a badge, or you don't really know what's going to come next from that engagement. There might be a certain hesitancy to share information with that individual. I want to be able to send our inspectors into the field and minimize that level of distrust that exists. And the only way to do that is to constantly make investments in that trust bank with each one of our residents to demonstrate that we are here to help. We are here to support. We are not here to um, be a labor that property owners can utilize against residents. Um, and that's, that's part of the focus of our Renters First campaign and uh, other engagement activities. So we are, we're leveraging multiple different avenues and we'll continue to leverage and go even farther to make our services, our sources, our staff, our data, everything as publicly available as possible. No, thank you so much. I think um, I appreciate your answer. And like I said, I, I, I understand that we do have some proactive measures and I just wanna make sure that we not only you as an incoming director, but us as a council, make sure that we're putting more resources into that proactiveness because I think that is something that our residents have you know, asked our city to be more proactive on, but I appreciate that answer. I have three more, I'll make it quick. Uh, council Member Chavez, we have a quorum issue, so I'd, it's been uh, 10 minutes already, I'd urge you to make it very quick. Cool, yes, so I have three more questions. Uh, this past winter was very difficult for many of our residents. I know that part of the role of regulatory services is to do education on parking violations. Just wondering if you can walk us through uh, what you have in mind for this year's winter in regards to educating our residents to make sure that we are complying with parking um, restrictions and making sure that we're accessible to people with different languages. Thank you, Chair Goodman, Councilmember Chavez. Uh, similar to my, my previous response, yep. I want to make sure that we are leveraging as many of the resources available, such as cultural radio stations, mm -hmm. such as getting into community, meeting with elders so that we are educating people and providing those that information as uh, in an appropriate way that is accessible for them to receive the information, um, not just the way that we want to communicate with them. Thank you. Uh, and then the other two parts are, I know that we do have a Renters First campaign. I do want to hear maybe some of the potential changes or potential policies your department is looking into as you head into this new role to add updates to that. And that can be work that the council does sure. too, so we can move on if that's. Uh, yes, please. Um, I don't have any specific talking points relating to our Renters First campaign mm -hmm. or any additional changes that we would make at this point. Um. Yeah, and that, that's totally fine. I think that's something that you're gonna find 
very much about support on this body. We're hoping to make massive changes in our renter first policies to make sure that our renters are being protected across the city and that's something that I'd love to partner uh, with you on. And I'll just, one last thing, I think this is really important to my constituents in Ward 9 and if Councilman Osman was here, he'd probably agree with me too, is how are we going to be addressing some of these nuisance properties in our neighborhoods? There's many absent landlords, absent property managers who leave buildings in neglect. Honestly, just leave them there, <laughs> vacant. Um, and what is something the, the regulatory services department, you as leading this new department, going to do to help not only work with the city council, but work to address some of these concerns that neighbors have? Certainly. Thank you for the question. Um, there's two different aspects to this. We have within our alternative enforcement team a separate team that focuses specifically on portfolios, looking at uh, organizations that look to purchase properties in bulk or who have a very lengthy portfolio of properties solely for investments where they can park their money, not really investing in the property, not really taking adequate steps to manage the property or manage the experience <laughs> for their residents. Um, so with that alternative enforcement team, we're able to and will continue to um, evaluate the entire portfolio of those properties to determine what are the experiences that each one of those different residents are having? As uh, an inspections unit, they are divided across the entire city. Uh, so utilizing this portfolio approach, we're able to disambiguate the different uh, experiences and thematically pull them together to identify some of the different pieces that are occurring, bring those property owners to the table so that we can uh, discuss operating conditions or even restricting their ability to continue to acquire properties and receive rental licenses. Um, that's one aspect. For other units that are not necessarily within the portfolio, those property owners are going to be held accountable. We are doing proactive inspections, especially during the summertime when we bring in some additional staffing to evaluate exterior nuisance and exterior risk. We are pulling in information from our crime prevention specialists, from our uh, 311 management system for complaints. We are evaluating all of these different uh, aspects of data so that we could hold each one of those different property owners accountable. And if that means that we have to revoke those licenses, then we will work through that process and make sure that that resident is not caught in, uh, caught in the fray as we work through that with the property owner, but making sure that their experience is not a bad one and that the, the properties that they're in are good quality, that they are safe, that they are livable for themselves and their family. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Interim Director. I, I will be supporting this motion to send a full council today. I have personally have enjoyed working with you tremendously. I am very excited that there is gonna be some Latino representation in the administration now that is something that has been really important to my constituents. I know that me and you may not have been, have, may not agree on everything. I, I, I understand that based on the conversations we have, but I do believe that you wanna see our residents in a better position than they are right now. And I hope that when difficult decisions come before you that you're able to see our neighbors, and I believe that you will, um, that they are human beings and they are deserving of dignity and respect. But yeah, the, I had to ask those questions because there are many <laughs> things that my residents have brought up regarding the regulatory services department across the year and nine months. And it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of changes that I, I, I personally would like to see. And I hope that um, your plate is full. And I hope to work with you in these changes, so. Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Mr. Valquez, uh, you are a true public servant, and you, uh, you are in the right spot at the right time to help us heal the city. I'll be voting for you, and I want you to know that I will always be here to support you. And uh, you will be threatened, you will be harassed, uh, but you have that strength, that inner strength to, to move the city forward. And I appreciate that, and thank you so much for working for the city of Minneapolis. Thank you, Councilmember Rainville. Uh, I wanted to see if the mayor had something to say. 
I do thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the City Council Committee. I'm here today to say a few words uh, about Enrique Velasquez and also ask for your support uh, in his appointment to the next uh, Director of Regulatory Services. Uh, many of you already know and have worked with Mr. Velasquez over the years and something that uh, almost uniformly uh, that everyone will say about him is, is he is very good at building trust. Uh, perhaps the most important commodity that we can have as city representatives and as the city enterprise right now is, is trust. Uh, it's a foundational element that is at times lacking and an element that absolutely we need to be building upon. Uh, and Interim Director Velasquez has time and again showed the ability to build trust in matters that matter most. Um, he's operated uh, in inspection services as part of the team on reg services, uh, as well as managing the licenses and consumer services team in the community planning economic development department uh, and financial analysis and system support uh, in public works, uh, in surface water and sewers. Uh, he's someone that has broad experience throughout the city, but in every single one of those uh, initiatives in each of those departments, uh, interim Director Velasquez has, has shown the ability to operate with integrity in some very difficult situations. Uh, and most everyone would say, and this is the, one of the only notes that I wrote on my paper uh, here, is you're a good person. Um, you're a deeply kind person. Uh, and God knows we can use a little bit more love, especially during these times, uh, and compassion. Uh, and that is the kind of service that you provide in everything that you do. Um, throughout his time in CPED and reg services, he's demonstrated a very deep uh, and abiding commitment uh, and maintaining and building rapport, not just with his colleagues, not just with council members, but with our residents of the city, uh, especially those that need help. Uh, and when you're operating and running a vast department like reg services that touches on everything from homeless encampments to animal care and control to traffic control. I mean, those three areas uh, obviously share a piece of reg, but they're vastly different for a thousand different reasons. And you've shown the ability to lead uh, with compassion and passion. Uh, I'm so proud to put your name forward um, you are not just the example of where we want to go, but also a good example of where we've come uh, in that you've risen through the ranks at City Hall. Uh, you've had uh, direct and indirect reports, many of whom are in this room that have helped to prepare you for this moment. Um, from Interim Director Hansen, uh, sitting right next to me, uh, to uh, Deputy uh, COO, Saray garnett Hohuli, uh, to Interim COO, Heather Johnston, uh, and I'm sure many others uh, that you have worked with, uh, you are the right person for this very difficult job. We believe in you, we support you. I'm proud to put your name forward and council members, I ask for your support. Thank you so much for the time. Council member Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, we've certainly ratcheted up the uh, anticipation here and uh, just um, happy to see all of your colleagues here. And then do you have family members here as well? So, and happy to see that your family is here supporting you. I think it speaks a lot to see the chamber full in this way. Uh, even the bench is a little bit full uh, today. Uh, so um, with that, I would love to move approval of your confirmation. On the motion to approve, I am going to just make a couple of comments. I'll leave my comments for the council meeting. Um, there is no more difficult job in this city than the director of regulatory services. Everyone who served in that capacity knows I say that and they know I mean it because I think I've been through about 20. And I can start naming them all from John Burquist to Rocco Forte and Kim Keller and everyone in between. It is a very difficult group because of the subject matter, not because of the employees. But the group under Kim Keller's leadership and then Saray's leadership really turned a corner and has this incredible level of cultural competence to deal with the kinds of issues that are inherent in this department, from someone's animal being taken away, to their rental license being revoked, to their housing being substandard. These are all very, very difficult issues, and it takes a very special 
person to do this work. When I met Enrique, he was a liquor license inspector, also a very difficult job. <laughs> and um, Patrick and I were really impressed with him. I won't speak for Patrick, but we were very impressed with his work as director of licensing, especially as it pertained to liquor licensing, because that's also a very unruly kind of thing to do. And he did it with incredible grace and integrity. And the move to inspections made me sad because I wanted him to stay in CPEG. Uh, so I'm, you know, just a bit selfish in that regard. And he did a really good job as director of inspections, a job that many people wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole, and we're grateful to all of our inspectors as well, which is a very difficult job. And I believe that hiring from within is a really important thing. I mean, we'd have more women in the city if we were able to hire women and then promote them. And this also goes for people of color that often are not promoted and overlooked and then leave and we lose that resource and that cultural competency that we think is so important. But most of all, I've gotten to know Enrique as a person. He knows that. It feels strange to talk about you looking this way instead of this way. Um, I hold you in very, very high regard. I think you are one of the best. Your personal story is just the very beginning of your story. Uh, because you have been able to lead in a city that's been under trauma for a whole time you've been here, basically. And so I'm really proud that the mayor appointed you to this position. I am thrilled to have the opportunity to vote for you for this position today. And I know that when I retire from my current position, my constituents will be well served by your leadership. Thank you for everything you've committed to the city. And Council Member Ellison's motion to approve, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That is approved, and that will be forwarded to the full council in two weeks. Thank you all for being here. We have two very quick items. Ms. Silas has been waiting a long time to give this update, and then I'll ask uh, Andra if she can just submit a written update. Uh, I have a quorum problem, and I know uh, Ms. Silas is going to be very, very brief. Good afternoon, Chair Goodman and committee members. Um, we are discussing, again, 2648 Marshall, which is a project to establish a cluster development on a site along the Mississippi River. Um, we, do we, do we You're continue? good. Okay. Um, we discussed this at our meeting on August 22nd. Uh, the applicant in question, Andy Wattenhofer, had submitted an appeal of the Planning Commission's decision to uh, deny two variances at their meeting on July 31st. The uh, committee was interested in the applicant's stated interest in entering into a memorandum of understanding with the Park and Recreation Board. Um, at their meeting last week on uh, Wednesday the 20th, the Park Board ad uh, adopted a, resolu a resolution um, approving a, a memorandum of understanding between the Park Board and the applicant. So that was approved at their meeting last week. And now the Park Board and the applicant will move forward on future acquisition of the site by the Park Board. And I'm happy to answer any questions, and the applicant is also here. Are there any questions? Council Member Ellison. Just a quick question. This was handed to us while we were up here, so I haven't had a chance to read it. Um, is, would you be in a position at all summarize the, the gist of this? Um, sure. Basically, the, the memorandum of understanding is just identifying that the Park Board does have acquisition of this site and other sites along Marshall in their long-term plans. The, this parcel in particular and surrounding ones are um, designated as parks in the future land use in the 2040 plan, which is noted here. Um, Don and Andy, as the property owners, are interested in uh, re, uh, establishing this new dwelling on the site and living there for the rest of their independent lives, which is noted in the memorandum. And the park board has also indicated through, within the memorandum um, some difficulties in developing the site in the near future, having to do with surrounding uses and um, current availability of funds. And right. so have authorized this future uh, discussion of acquisition, um, you know, not in the near term. Okay, just maybe I can refine my question. Thank you. Um, is it, uh, did they agree to sort of like 
of uh, right of first refusal, land transfer? Is it that detailed or they've just MOU to discuss a purchase later? Exactly. The memorandum of understanding, as I understand it, is that it authorizes park board staff to get into the details with the applicant about how that acquisition will happen. So the MOU sets forth a timeline for negotiation for a legally binding agreement, which would come before the park board commissioners in 2024. Thank you. Great. And I will note that, thank you, Ms. Silas, I'll note that this is what uh, the committee and council member Payne asked for. Essentially, it is exactly what we asked for. So as a result of that, I am going to move approval of the variance appeal by Andrew Wattendorfer and uh, thank our staff as well as uh, Mr. Wattendorfer and his family and the park board uh, and Council Member Payne for getting us to this point. Uh, is there any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item is approved, and I'll note that uh, Ms. Bonsag has a report that she can prepare, give, send us in writing, which is what I had suggested at agenda setting, given the timing of this meeting, and I appreciate everyone's patience here today. Seeing no further business and without um, objection, I declare the meeting adjourned.